Well, greetings to you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, before we um, hear from God's word and hear the message that's being prepared from it, let us seek the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and heavenly Father, again we mourn that we are not together, that we are meeting in this virtual way, and yet, Father, we thank you for your help and your comfort through these past weeks. We thank you, O Lord, for the protection over our health. We thank you, O Lord, for the answered prayers that we have seen within these weeks. Lord, now as we approach your word, may we hear, truly hear, what you have to say to your church today. Let us be informed, let us grow, and let us worship your holy name. For thou art worthy, O triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Let us hear from God's word. The reading today is taken from Psalm 102. Psalm 102. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure for ever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favour her. Yea, the set time is come, for thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favour the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute, and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven, did the Lord behold the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord, he weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. 
but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. Amen. This is God's holy word. We, as we know, are living in times of great strain and stress for us as individuals, as a nation and as a global community. We look around us and we can feel the fear that so many exhibit. The fear of illness, the fear of isolation and the fear of death. This truly is a season of change and uncertainty. Our day-to-day -day lives have changed beyond recognition. This time two weeks ago, we sat in these pews and enjoyed fellowship together. Today, we are meeting via a little screen. We might be amongst our family, but we are not amidst the family, the family. My brothers and sisters in Christ are dispersed. They are not here and I am not with them. Our lives have changed, not only in our corporate worship, but also in our individual lives. There are restrictions upon whom we can visit, where we can go and even what we can buy in the supermarkets. And with this change comes that sense of uncertainty. No longer are our days set to the rhythm of normality, whatever that was. The schools are shut, so we don't have that five-day pattern, that routine that we have been accustomed to. The working week looks so very different from the nine to five that was once such a recurring theme of our days. Uncertainty in our working life, uncertainty in our private life, Uncertainty of, uh, of whether we can even buy the necessities that we took for granted just two weeks ago in our Western world. The questions that arise in our minds that cause us trouble. Things have changed so much. What happens if I get ill or our loved one gets ill? It's uncertain that we will be seen by our GPs and even our hospitals. What happens if we have a, a dental emergency? What happens if our pets get ill? All of these are, are now shrouded with uncertainty and with uncertainty often come, comes panic and fear. Change and uncertainty seem to have become our new normality and that is unsettling to us. So how do we as disciples of Jesus Christ, how do we as Christians view all of this? How do we respond? Our psalm that we have just read talks into this very subject. When the world is a scary place to be living in, when our normal is turned upside down on its head, when everywhere that we turn, everything that seemed to be so stable before, we see the reality that there is no stability there. It is times like these that we are to be reminded of the truth of who God is. We must allow his word to bring us back onto that solid ground. Ground that can be depended upon. And that is why we were looking to Psalm 102 together today. The setting of this psalm, when originally penned, might be different to our situation. But the truth, the assurance and the comfort that is found here is eternally unchanging. We can break down the structure of this psalm in this way. Verses 1 to 2, a cry for help. Verses 3 to 11, the distressing situation. Verses 12 to 22, confidence in the Lord and in his promises. And then finally, verses 23 to 28, the certainty of God. The title of this psalm is extraordinary. There is no other psalm in the Psalter that has a title quite like this. 
a prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. We are not given the psalm's author or any tangible evidence within the psalm as to what caused its writing. Yet here is a psalm that has given the people of God comfort throughout the ages. And it starts with a heart-rending cry to God, a cry for help. Verse 1. Hear my prayers, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. This desperate cry for help is grounded in the psalmist's faith in God. We would not call out somebody for help unless we knew that they had the ability to actually help, would we? If drowning in a lake, would we cry out to a tree or to a shrub to come and save us rather than the person walking their dog? No, of course not. We would cry out in this situation to the one that could actually help us. And this is what the psalmist does here. He raises his prayer to God and acknowledges that the situation is beyond himself. It is beyond the psalmist to endure and he cannot rescue himself from his situation. There is a plea to be heard and for the Lord not to turn a deaf ear to his cries. But he is in trouble and is so desperate that he desires his God to hear his prayer quickly. The psalmist in verses 3 to 11 moves into the reasons for him calling out to the Lord. It is because of the distressing situation, the circumstance that he finds himself in. In these verses we see the psalmist lament about his weakness as displayed by his feeling of mortality. We see his loneliness pictured by an illustration of three birds. We see that he acknowledges that the Almighty is the one with the power to place him in this position and the one also able to take him out of this position. Verse three. For my days are consumed like smoke. And my bones are burned as on hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread, and mingled my drink with weeping, because of thine indignation and thy wrath. For thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow, a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. Can you hear the psalmist's place? Can you feel the cry that he cries out and laments to God regarding his situation and his weakness? In verses 3, 4 and 11, we see the psalmist lament regarding his own mortality, his feebleness in the situation and the shortness and the weakness of his life. In verse 3, he likens his life to smoke. In verse 4, he tells us of the weakness of his heart. It is like the withered grass. 
And in verse 11, he likens his life to a shadow that is, is fading away. All of this points to the psalmist's understanding of the brevity, the weakness, the helplessness of the human condition. In days of youth, in days of health and strength, we often forget that the true nature of our fallen humanity. We feel invincible, strong, as if we can continue in this way forever, without regard nor care for the days that lie ahead of us. But bring us to times of trouble. Bring us to times of illness and of weakness. It is then that we are brought to our knees. And in these circumstances, the, the, the psalmist feels so alone and isolated. We prayed on Thursday for all those who at this time feel the same way, isolated, separated from society, separated from their friends. There is no joy in life. And he pictures this for us with the image of three birds. First of all, an unknown bird that our translation calls a pelican. A small owl is the second bird and a sorrowful sparrow is the third. The bird that is called a pelican in our translation or large owl in other translations is an unclean bird according to the Levitical laws. It is an unclean bird and here this bird is alone. It is singular. Alone in the wilderness, a word that here means the, the opposite of those settled cities and rural regions where there is help just around the corner, devoid of company. This bird is unclean and is alone. And this is the image it conveys. Unclean, alone, and any good Jew who, who would look upon this, would be disgusted at seeing such a creature. He next likens himself to another unclean bird, a small owl. It lives in the desert, a word that means amongst the ruins, a desolated and ruined place. Again, unclean and alone and not in the place that we would desire to live in. The next bird that we see is the sparrow, this time a clean bird, and normally a social bird. Yet here we see the utter loneliness of this sparrow. Normally sparrows mate for life, and here the images of a sparrow that has lost its mate, pining away on the top of a house, in the midst of the hustle and bustle of the city. It looks about, it sees the joy of everyone else, and yet it, alone, devoid of joy, totally alone in the crowd. And with these striking word pictures, the psalmist tells God of how he feels, weak, mortal, and alone, pining away and without any strength. Yet in the midst of this, we see a strange thing. In our opening verses, it is to the Lord that he raises his petition. And here in verse 10, the psalmist places the reasons for his condition firmly in the power of the one to whom he prays to. It is because of the Lord's indignation and wrath that the psalmist is in this position. It is the Lord himself who has in the past raised the psalmist to times of joy and prosperity. And it is the same Lord who now allows this casting down. This knowledge of the psalmist's weakness and mortality. This misery and feeling of emptiness and loneliness and yet here it is from verse 10 we take a turn a turn from those circumstances and feelings that are all around him the feelings and the circumstances of the here and now to a declaration of faith 
in the goodness of the Lord for the future. For the psalmist has confidence in his Lord and those certain promises of God. The confidence in his Lord and in his promises. They change his prayer. They change his outlook. They change the whole nature of uh, the following passage. And they all stem from the psalmist's understanding of who God is. And we will return to this later on in this message. But for now, notice in these verses how the atmosphere of this psalm changes. From the desperate cry from the psalmist, acknowledging his own mortality, his weakness and his isolation. Now we move into a burst of unexpected optimism. The psalmist is still in the same circumstances. His position in life has not changed. But now we see and hear the psalmist taking away his gaze from himself from his situation and turning his eyes to the Lord and to the word of the Lord. The Lord who is eternal. The Lord who is strong and who is involved in the affairs of of his world and our world. Verse 12. But thou, in contrast, but thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. What a difference this change of perspective brings. It settles the psalmist in his small little world and turns his attention to the steadfast God of the scriptures, the vastness and the power of this God. And from this vantage point, our true position in time can be seen. Strength can be obtained and hope for the future is now in view. For this same God who has lifted and debased the psalmist has promised that he will not abandon his people. He will not abandon Israel nor forsake them. He is not idly and helplessly looking on and wishing that he could help. He is not a God that gets tired and needs to take a nap. No, it is this God that holds the time in his hands. The hands of clocks move in accordance to his decree and the psalmist knows this. Verse 13, thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favour her. Yea, the set time is come. God elsewhere in the scriptures has promised that he has chosen Zion. Listen to this psalm of ascent. Psalm 132 verses 13 and 18. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for my anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. The psalmist acknowledges that it will be according to God's purposes. But not only his purposes, but his time. It will be in the Lord's timing that there is an appointed time for all things under the heaven to occur even the coronavirus that we're experiencing today. The thought behind this is that it is God himself that appoints all that flows out in history, that he has determined and has a determined plan 
for this world and this universe and that they are all in his appointment. There is a looking forward to the establishment and outworking of God's sovereign plan in time and space. And in that appointed time, the Lord will indeed come to the rescue of his people and bring glory to his name. Let us continue verse 15. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. The psalmist knows that this is based on God's own testimony. His own testimony in his word. He has stated it and he will bring it to completion. Regardless of how the situation and circumstances of life might look to us right now. This is the same confidence that we can have. There is no doubt that these certain promises of God will come to pass. Verses 18 to 22. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner. To loose those that are appointed to death. To declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord. I think the psalmist looks way past his own time. He looks towards that time prophesied in Isaiah. Spoken about by our Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. That kingdom that God will establish upon the earth. And that is where he is looking to, the future of God's kingdom, of the glory of God being observed and feared by all upon the earth. And as we touched upon earlier, the change of outlook stems from the psalmist understanding of who God is, his very essence. And it is here that I want us to pay special attention. We have it spoken about in verse 12 and expanded upon in the last verses of this psalm. What the psalmist knows to be true about God. What we need to be know about God in these changing times is his stability. The theological word that is often used to describe this is his immutability. That is, God remains the same, never changing, either by addition or subtraction. The triune God alone is stable. Our triune God alone is ever unchanging. He is never becoming. He doesn't have a beginning and he is without end. He is the great I am of the scriptures. Verse 12, but thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever and thy remembrance unto all generations. The psalmist shows this in juxtaposition between what we consider to be stable and unchanging and to that which is truly stable and unchanging. That thing that has been here before we were born. And if the Lord tarries, will be for a millennia after we have departed from this life. This is, of course, the world, our universe. And placed in full view above and beyond our world and universe is its creator by the psalmist. The eternal triune God. As we think about the world. We often do not think of its creation or its termination. 
It is the one solid thing that we all experience, that we take for granted. We take for granted that as we place one foot in front of another, the solid earth will bear our weight. Yet the scriptures tell us, in comparison to God, this earth is not as stable as he. For God is eternal. This world, this universe had a beginning. It is in and owned by time. And one day that time will run out. It will perish. It will be transformed. The psalmist reflects upon the stability of this world and concludes that it is in the power of God. Verse 25 to the end. Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shall endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, of a vesture shall they, thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. The earth shall perish. It shall grow old like a threadbare garment. It shall one day be no good for its intended purpose and shall be changed like a piece of clothing. But God, but God remains the same. His years will not change him. There is no best before day or expiration of God unlike this universe. God has always been always is and will always be. He alone endures. The heavens and the earth had a beginning and God was there for it and the cause of it. He truly is the alpha of all things. The heaven and the earth will have an ending and God will be there for that as well and also the cause of it. He will remain even after the heavens and the earth, as we know it, will have passed away. For he truly is the Omega of all things. He alone is the beginning and the end. Father, Son and Spirit, eternal, unchanging, stable and dependable. There is so much comfort that can be known as we know God aright. His immutability means that he cannot and does not change for the better, nor can he change for the worse. He is not like our, our humanity or our universe. Hear the words from Malachi 3 verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. This means that God never has a bad day. He doesn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed. This means we do not need to wonder what kind of disposition the Lord has to us. And because God is immutable, his love for us never changes. His mercy toward us never changes. His grace given to us never changes. Even when we find our eyes looking to our circumstances, our weakness, our own mortality and not to our true stability. Even then, when we show ourselves faithless, he does not change. God always proves himself faithful to his people. To Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. He cannot be anything other than he is because he is immutable. 
when we are surrounded with the uncertainty, when life is unsettling and full of worry, I, and I hope we, can find great comfort in the immutability of our God. For the same Jesus that gave his life for us, the same Jesus that shed his blood to make an atonement for our sins is the same yesterday and today and forever, as Hebrews 13, 8 tells us. This means that the blood that was shed will never lose its power. The cleansing of that blood will never become deficient. And that the acceptance of that sacrifice will always be in place for his people, for life everlasting to those who believe. Jesus still came into this world to save sinners. He is unchangeable. It was his purpose then. That's why he died. That's why he rose. That's why he ascended to the Father. It hasn't changed. Jesus still is in the, the process of calling his lost sheep. Jesus still makes intercession before the Father's throne on behalf of his people. Aren't you glad that God is not like men who change from day to day, if not from moment to moment? In these days of coronavirus and the circumstances that we each face in these unprecedented times, we can take comfort in the God who changes not, knowing that all things, including my health, my circumstances are under his control and plan. We take comfort that our God is unchangeable in his holiness, unchangeable in his goodness, unchangeable in his purpose. He is immutable and his immutability assures us that nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing happens without his permission. And we can and must take refuge in the only stable place in the universe. The unchanging, the unchangeable, the immutable God of scriptures. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we may not be in the same situation as the psalmist, but as your word declares, this is a, a prayer of the afflicted. When we are overwhelmed and we pour out our complaint before you. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who heard that prayer and who will answer it. You are the same God who hears our prayers as they are prayed in accordance with your will. We thank you that you are unchangeable, that you are immutable. Lord, that you are safe, secure, stable, persistent. Lord, if it were not for your immutability, we would each fear for our lives. The sin that we committed, was it heinous enough for my God to turn his face away from me? Was that sin that I considered in my heart, is it enough for the Saviour to reject me? And yet, because you, O oh God, Father, Son and Spirit are immutable, we know that we never need to fear while we are safe in Jesus Christ. And although this world is changing, 
is unstable. Lord, the way humanity looks about, upon life, looks upon morality, how our politicians, how the people that we normally rub shoulders with, Lord, it is changeable. It changes from decade to decade, moment from moment. But your word, because it is based in your voice, is unchangeable and secure. And we declare, O oh God, that we long for those promises to be fulfilled. When we shall see the glory of God in the flesh. And nothing can rob us of that certain hope. Not life, not death, not coronavirus, not illness, not weakness, Lord, not loneliness, not anything can separate us from the promises in Christ Jesus. Father, forgive us our weakness. Forgive us that our eyes are so often turned away from our only help, from our only source of comfort. And we are so busy worrying about the circumstances of life, the what ifs of life, that we take our eyes off of thee. Father, be pleased to impress your word into our hearts. And the next time that we worry, that we're prone to worry, Lord, remind us of your unchanging being your holiness, your goodness, and your promises that in Christ Jesus, we are secure and safe. Lord, hear and answer our prayer to the glory of Christ, we ask, and the edifying, the upbuilding of his body, the church. Amen. <laughs>